Now let's join our hearts together in prayer. Loving God, creator, sustainer, and provider, we offer you our worship today. We know that we are unworthy to worship you. We are a sinful people. We so easily give in to temptation and do the things that we are forbidden to do. Please, Lord, forgive us. We thank you that you are a merciful God, that you do not deal with us as our sins deserve, but you have promised that if we confess our sins, you, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So please, Lord, accept our confession now and wash away our sins in the precious blood of Jesus. And we ask that as we unite together in this act of worship, that you will bless us by sending your Holy Spirit amongst us. By your Spirit, take control of our minds, direct our thoughts. Show us how to worship that we may worship you in spirit and in truth today. Make your word a living word to our hearts and souls, a word that refreshes the weary, encourages the cast down, renews those who stumble, and lifts them up to a closer relationship with Jesus. We pray today once more for the needs of your people, in both of our congregations, Lord, we know that there are those with particular need. We think of the older people. We know, Lord, that bodily weakness is a problem for them, and we pray that you would grant them your strength and give them good health day after day. May those who are ill look to you for healing. Because you alone are the great physician, you are the one who brings about recovery of strength. We pray particularly for people such as Ruth and Ivan who contend with long-term illness. I ask that you would grant them that grace to continue to cope with this. We know that you are aware of the needs in every home. We pray, Lord, that you would respond lovingly to those needs today again. Give wisdom in making decisions. Grant patience in dealing with difficulties. Supply all that we need as we seek to live to your glory. Be gracious unto our children and youth and lead them in right paths in life. Help them to grow into mature and responsible believers. We do pray for an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. But again, we submit to your will. We know that all things are in your hands and are being used to fulfill your great eternal purpose. Help us to submit to whatever you have laid down for our lives. We pray your blessing upon those who work in the medical profession, particularly those who have to deal with critical illness day by day. Help them to cope, guard them from personal illness, and undertake for their families too. We pray, Lord, that day by day they would be conscious of your help. Now, Lord, bless us as we read your word and as we consider the things that are written there. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts this day. And we offer our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's now read from God's word. We turn to John's Gospel, to chapter 11. And we read from verses 17 through to 44. Last week we considered the first 16 verses of this chapter. And our address today continues on with this story. The story of the raising of Lazarus. 
the one who had died, whom Jesus raised from the dead. So let us uh, read the word of God. So when Jesus came, he found that he, that's Lazarus, had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Mary and Martha to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister, saying, The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there is a stench, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you, you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Amen. May God again bless this reading of his word to each of our hearts today. For us, death is a tragedy. It's the end of a life, it's the separation of a friendship or a relationship. Something that we find it hard to cope with. But Jesus wants us here to understand death in a different way. As believers, although death is painful and separation hurts, 
Jesus wants us to see that death introduces something special to those who are trusting in him. It introduces the possibility of entering into the glory of God. We thought about this last time. Even though there is grief and pain for those who have been bereaved, for the believer who dies in Christ, they enter into the fullness of glory with God forever. Now this is only possible because Jesus gave up his glory in heaven and came down to this earth to live amongst mankind so that he could die as the sinless one and pay the price that was due for our sin. We need to always remember that when Christ died on the cross, it was the greatest act of love that the world would ever see. The innocent giving his life in place of the guilty. And when he rose from the dead, he demonstrated his power over death to the glory of God. By believing in Christ. By accepting him as our saviour, this is the only way that we as sinners may be saved and receive the promises of eternal glory with God. You know, we have different ways perhaps of evaluating God and evaluating God's love. It might be easy to measure the love of God uh, by how healthy you are or by how wealthy you are, by the comfort that you have in your life. But that would be the wrong yardstick. Measuring God's love in these ways is not what we are supposed to do. We are to measure God's love by what he gave us. He gave us his one and only son to die for us. He gave us the gift of eternal life at the cost of his son. And this portion of scripture before us here in John chapter 11 is to help us understand something of this. We looked at it last week. We turn back to it again here today. Eternal life. What is eternal life? Well, what does the Bible tell us about eternal life? In John 17 verse 3 it says, this is eternal life. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Here is the essence of eternal life. This never-ending knowing of God. God so loved the world that at the cost of his son's life, he brought us into an everlasting, eternal, immeasurable, knowing, admiring, loving relationship with him forever. In these days, there's so much suffering and loss and darkness in so many homes, amongst so many families. For those people, it might seem that everything they hold dear or count valuable has been taken away. For all of us, when death visits our homes, there's an element of that. But Jesus is saying to us here that when we understand him, and we understand his love for us. We should be looking at these things in a different way. Death shouldn't hold a frightening darkness for us. And that's the point of John chapter 11. It's to show us 
what Jesus does with death. He loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But he let Lazarus die so that the glory of God could be revealed. The power that he has over death. So let's go back to these verses that we have read today. But first of all, think about what Jesus meant when in verses 9 and 10 he says, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. What do you make of that? Well, let's look at the context. The disciples have heard Jesus say that he's going to Judea. And they have suggested to him, if you go to Judea, you're going to run into a mob and get stoned. But Jesus is saying, no, I won't. There are 12 hours in the day and I'm going to walk in the light of those 12 hours. I won't be in the dark. And so I won't stumble. I won't be stoned. I will arrive at my appointment. The appointment of the cross. Exactly when I am intended to arrive there. Jesus had hinted at this before. Back in John 9 verse 4. He says there, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. The day Jesus has in mind is the period of time in which God's providence and favour are surrounding him. When that extraordinary protection and power that enabled him to walk away from those who sought to stone him was made manifest. God was watching over him in the time of light. There are 12 hours in the day. It means there will be a complete day. That the time that Jesus has on the earth under God's protection will be what it is meant to be. And so we can go to Jerusalem. And we have no worry about being stoned. Because it's not yet the darkness. It's not yet time. Thomas is not convinced. But nevertheless, he replies, okay, let us also go that we may die with him. And what we want to look at now today is what happens when Jesus arrives just outside Bethany. There are three different people who confront him and question his love for Lazarus. Verse 6 said, when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And everybody knew that. Everybody knew that he could have made it in time to save Lazarus, to prevent him dying. But he hadn't. And now they question why. First of all, let's see here how Jesus reveals great truth about himself. The first to question him is Martha. In verse 21 she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And she's questioning why he hasn't come in time. But then she goes on, but even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus replies, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. 
And to that Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And what Jesus is saying to Martha here is this. You believe that there is going to be a glorious day of resurrection. A day when all believers will be bodily raised from the grave. And you're right. But here's a truth. I have come to introduce that day. I am the resurrection and the life. You believe that day will come with the Messiah. I am Messiah. The day has come. I am revealing my power and my glory to you through the death of Lazarus. And this is being done because I love you. And what he is saying is, and let me be clear, Martha, I am exactly what Lazarus needs and what you need. Lazarus is dead. You are alive. So listen. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. That's for Lazarus. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. That's for you. I will rescue Lazarus, body and soul, from the grave. And it will be as if he had never died. And as for you, you're alive. And you believe in me. And so you will never die. There will never be one moment when you are out of saving fellowship with me. Do you know what this means, Martha? It means I love you. And I love your brother. And I will not abandon his soul to the pit or let his flesh be destroyed. I will raise him and I will keep you both in everlasting fellowship with me. I am telling you this. I am revealing my power and my glory to you. Because I love you. This is the truth. A profound truth. A great truth. That Jesus reveals those whom he loves, he will glorify, he will raise. And secondly here, Jesus reveals the depth of his emotion. The second accusation comes from Mary. She says in verse 32, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And notice how she says it. She says it with tears in her eyes. She is weeping. And Jesus saw her weeping. And the Jews who had come with her also weeping. And they were asking, where were you when we needed you? And you can hear them sobbing and the words coming through their sobs. Where were you? And the agony of that. And it's appropriate here that in his response, Jesus displays the depth of his emotion. He also weeps. There's much discussion over what is meant here by Jesus weeping. Some people suggest that he is full of grief himself. Full of grief for the death of Lazarus or full of grief because of the pain that others are feeling. 
But you know, when you look a little closer at these verses, notice that there are a couple of words that need to be understood. Jesus was deeply moved and greatly troubled. Moved and troubled. That first word, deeply moved, is used again in verse 38 and three times outside this gospel. It's never a word of compassion, but a word of rebuke or warning. And the other word, greatly troubled, signifies being shaken or agitated. It's the very same word that's used for the stirring of the waters in the pool of Bethesda. And it's the word that Jesus will use in John 14 verse 1. Let not your hearts be troubled. You see, it seems that Jesus wasn't shaken so much by grief as he was annoyed and disturbed. At the attitude of those who questioned him. They questioned his love for Lazarus, for Mary and for Martha. And so here now with emotional force. Mary had said, Lord, if you had been here. And the tone of her words disturbed Jesus. And he weeps and he hurts. And that same emotion arises in him again in verse 37. Some looked at us weeping and they said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? And they are questioning Jesus' love. I've taken the line here before that Jesus is angry at his great enemy death. And probably to a degree he is. But there has to be something more because Jesus allowed this death to happen. And what John is saying is because they question his love, Jesus is deeply disturbed in his spirit and he came to the tomb. The whole story and the use of the Greek grammar point to Jesus being deeply disturbed that these people could question his love. And we should understand that this deep emotion is a clear revelation of Christ's glory. Christ is not a on feeling stone. He is a man full of human emotion, but he's also God, which really impacts greatly on that emotion. He has strong, deep emotional feelings. That's revealed to us here as he weeps. And is hurt at how people think of him. And then finally Jesus demonstrates his power. It's not enough to have profound truth and strong emotion. We need the powerful demonstration of these things. So Jesus says, take away the stone. And one last time, Martha resists. She's not yet completely confident of what Jesus will do. Lord, by this time there will be an odour, for he has been dead four days. And now Jesus makes the connection between what he is doing and what he said back in verse 4 of the chapter. This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So Jesus says to Martha, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? He then prays, publicly, openly prays, 
And he does this so that those who are around can see that he is one with his father. And then he cries out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Verse 44 tells us that the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Here, the power and the glory of Jesus is in full display. He raised Lazarus from the dead and there's no doubt that he was dead we thought of that last time the proof is there he was already beginning to smell in the grave but now Jesus raises him he who has claimed I am the resurrection and the life displays the truth of what he has said that he has the power to renew even those who have died. Not only died, but began to rot. Not even began to rot, but who have disintegrated into oblivion. He can raise all of them. Believers today. Remember this. Jesus, who loves you, will raise you from the dead. And when he raises you, you will shine like the sun in the kingdom of his Father. Lazarus is a preview of your own resurrection. One day Jesus is coming back to this earth. He comes with power and might. He comes to judge the living and the dead. And we are told that the graves will be opened. And the bodies of the dead will be raised. And this chapter, this event, this story of Lazarus is a window into that day. In this God is saying to each of us today, I love you. My love for you is not to spare you from suffering and death. My love for you is shown in the gift of myself who died in your place. And it is my promise to raise you again, even if you die, that you may see me in my glory. Do you see this? Do you see Jesus for who he really is? The one who died that you might live. The one who has power over death and who can deliver you to glory. Who can raise you and renew you and restore you completely on the judgment day. Come to Jesus today and be saved if you haven't already done so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these wonderfully comforting words to our hearts today. And Lord, we confess that so often we are more concerned about worldly comforts, things like health and contentment, than with the things of eternity. Please forgive us and help us to be more heavenly minded. Fill us with a great appreciation of how much Jesus loves us. Of the depth of the emotion that motivates him. And the desire he has to save us to glory. And Lord we pray that you will speak to any unsaved person listening to these words. Help them to see how much Jesus loves them. And how much they need to be saved by him. Guide them to cry out to Jesus today. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon all of God's people this day and forevermore. Amen.
let's bring our service to a close by singing the words of Psalm 130 or 113, the B version. Psalm 113 B. Praise Jehovah, praise the Lord. Yea, his servants praise accord. Blessed be Jehovah's name, evermore his praise proclaim. Stanza 3 says, Who is like the Lord our God? High in heaven is his abode, who himself doth humble low things in heaven and earth to know. Here the psalm writer reminds us that our God is not some remote and distant being sitting in heaven uh, remote from his people. But rather he is a God who is intimately involved in all of our lives with all the affairs of men on this earth. He knows exactly what is going on and he is very much a part of it all. Let us unite in praising him.